Hello, this is the um, YouTube video to accompany my podcast exploring Herbert Howells' clarinet sonata. Um, before we go any further, the first thing I feel that I need to explain for anybody that isn't clear on what modes are in music um, is to go through what I mean by that. <laughs> Um, apart from major and minor and chromatic scales and all the things that we generally learn when we're um, first learning an instrument, there are a number of other musical modes that predate the traditional diatonic scales that we have come to know and practice as, as uh, the mainstay of our technique. So if you can see here, if you look across this top line here, you can see the seven principal musical modes that are neither major nor minor. Now, these modes, they take their name from Greek modes. And this was something that was adopted in the Middle Ages when uh, church music was being formalised and the religious musical scholars at the time and the composers liked the idea of basing the, the, the scales or the modes that they were creating their plain chants, they liked the idea that they were based on these original Greek modes. The names themselves actually come from specific areas of um, the Greek Empire and, and Asia Minor, as it was at the time. So you've got Ionian, which is, obviously we have the Ionian Sea, um, and you can go through, so these places, Lydia, Locria, Phrygia, these were all areas in Greece. So, whilst these names were adopted in the Middle Ages, they still carry through to this day, particularly when we're looking at folk music or music that was handed down through the, sort of the oral tradition. Um, and Howells, whilst he was certainly influenced by the, the rise in uh, interest in folk music at the beginning of the 20th century and the end of the 19th century, people like Vaughan Williams, for example, were going around and collecting folk songs from uh, people in the field, sailors, you know, going around the taverns, because they realised that this was a dying art form. And particularly with things like the First World War, which changed barriers, lots of composers in the West, in Western Europe, were concerned with safeguarding and documenting folk song. And... This was, obviously, was, was very popular at the time. Now, Howells isn't necessarily a composer that I think um, weaves folk song into his pieces in, a, in a, an explicit way, but his heritage and the times in which he was living meant that he was influenced by what was going on. But the wonderful thing about the clarinet sonata is that he has a much more sophisticated uh, use of modes, and he creates his own very distinctive and individual musical language based on these these seven modes, and adding in his own chromatic touches. So all the things that ha um, the Romantic period, and particularly the late Romantic period, are famous for, which is chromaticism and tra uh, uh, modulation in a more chromatic way. Uh, Howells wove into his own particular use of tonality. So I just wanted to start with this, this uh, chart here. So the way that modes work is if you assume that, um, for example, that C major, so if you look at the top here, we have C major, and if you look across, you can see all the notes of the C major scale. So across here. Now, if you rearrange the notes of the C major scale, and you, you, you change the starting position, then you get each of the different modes. So you can see Ionian is what we would describe now as being the major scale. Okay, so that's predictable. If you say C Ionian, then people are going to understand that that's just a normal diatonic C major scale. But if you start on the D, and you go from here, 
and you carry on through and you go D, E, F, G, A, B, C, what you get is a scale that sounds a little bit like D natural minor, only it doesn't have a B flat. So, and that's the quality of the Dorian mode, is that it, it has notes that you would attribute if you took a triad there. So we had D, F, A, and that's a D minor triad. But because there's no B flat and there's no C sharp, that's not a harmonic minor, and if it was D natural minor, that would be a B flat and a C natural. So it's it's neither one nor the other. It's not major, it's not minor in the true sense of the word, either type of the minor, major, uh, harmonic or melodic. But if you start on D and you have those intervals, those specific intervals, specific intervals rather, then that was what we would call D Dorian. Now you can see the one that's highlighted here. Um, if you start on B and then you go through using the notes of the E major scale, so B, C sharp, D sharp, E, F sharp, G sharp, A here, and we'll chart these through, then that's what we would call the Mixolydian scale. So the easy way of remembering this is that if you can remember the order of, of modes, Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, and Locrian, then that's which numbered note in a major scale you start on, you remove the, you move the position. So a note starting on B using the notes of E major, so B would be the root and the key note, that would be described as B mixolydian. So hopefully that makes sense so far. And this, this, this mode chart is very useful for trying to work out what specific harmonies are when you know you've got maybe a key signature. And as we look at the howls, you'll see that he still uses key signatures, but the tonal center is not what we would normally attribute to a particular key signature. So we'll be looking at that in a moment. So what modes does Howells use most often in the clarinet sonata? So I've just, there are many, but these are the first five modes that I've identified that he uses and uh, transposes into different uh, key centres. So the first one is um, the D Dorian scale. So this is the one that's based on the second degree of um, that major, uh, C major scale. So you, as you can see here, what I've done is I've just written the scale out. So D Dorian is D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And I've put a red line under the C to show you that that's uh, the, the, the scale on which it's based. So D Dorian is not based on a D major scale, as you might think. It's telling you that the, the keynote is D, and you're using the Dorian scale. So in this instance, the red um, underlined C means that it's using the notes of the C major scale. So D Dorian is still using the C major uh, scale notes, but it's starting on D. And it's deriving its chords from D being its um, keynote. The next one we have, which is the next in order, it's the one that's based on the third of the C major scale, is the Phrygian mode. And there are a couple of instances in Howell's sonata where we have the F-sharp Phrygian. So again, the underlying note here is D. So what that's telling you, because the Phrygian is based on the third, we are, we're using here the D major scale notes. So we've got perhaps a key signature of F-sharp and C-sharp, but the key centre is the third note, not the D. So it's starting on the F-sharp, um, and that gives us the F-sharp Phrygian. The next one that we have, this is the scale based on the fourth degree of the scale, um, is the Lydian mode. And this is often described as being the lightest sounding, the one that's, you know, it's... Um, closest, if you like, to a major scale in terms of sounding, sounding happy. And the reason for this is because the fourth degree of the Lydian mode is effectively a raised note. It's a sharpened fourth. So you can see here, if I um, just circle that here, if you looked at that in terms of it being in relation to C major, the note that's different in the Lydian mode is the fourth degree is sharpened. So that gives you almost the beginning of a whole tone scale. So C, D, E, F sharp. So that's the note that's different. So it has a lightness to it. And so it tends to be used to have that sort of brightness, a bright character to it. So here, as again, you can see the notes of the C Lydian is based on G major scale notes. But we're starting on the fourth degree of the scale. 
Then we have the fantastically named Mixolydian. Um, the Mixolydian is based on the fifth, and obviously in normal diatonic harmony, when we're talking about tonics and dominance, the fifth is the most important, and it still is. It's the next most important after the tonic, and it still continues to be so, even though we're, we're using modes. So the mode that is based on the fifth degree of the scale is called the Mixolydian. And this is one that's often used in jazz, because it has a dominant seventh in it, and it's one of these chords that sounds it's got a flattened seventh. So if you can see here the red the red underlining for B flat mixolydian means that we're using the notes of the E flat major scale. So we're starting on B flat, which is the fifth note um, from E flat. But because we start on B flat, that gives us here we end up with um, this uh, dominant seventh. We have a flat seven. So um, we've got B flat C, sorry, B flat D F A flat. So that's the um, the traditional dominant seventh. The next one um, from that Howells uses, and it's the last one that I've identified at least that uh, Howells uses in this clarinet sonata is the Aeolian mode. This is one that we would all be you know reasonably familiar with because the Aeolian mode is um, more commonly known as the natural minor. So what that means is instead of having a raised seventh, which you would have if you had a harmonic minor, you play all the notes of the major scale, but you don't raise the seventh. So here you can see we have B Aeolian, which is using the D major scale. As you can see, we've got underlined D. But we're starting on B, which is the sixth degree of the scale, and we go through, and it looks very similar to B minor, but there's no raised seventh, there's no A sharp, and so it's what we call the natural minor, or in this case, B Aeolian, if we're talking about it in modal sense. So these are the five principal modes that Howells um, uses in his clarinet sonata. We, you can see we don't really refer to the Ionian, it seems silly to do that in the context of a piece like this. And the Locrian mode, which is the most difficult one, the one that's based on the seventh degree of the scale, is used not really quite rarely. Um, it's a particularly um, troublesome mode because it has a diminished triad within it. Um, and that makes it quite tricky, it makes it quite angular. So it can only be used in you know, really small bursts um, because otherwise we have a, a very particular sound quality. So, and, and Howells doesn't use it in the clarinet sonata. Now, outside of this, um, there are many different variations on these as well. So, whilst these are the principal seven modes, there are other modes that can be described. Sometimes it might be involving um, scales that come from particular parts of the world. So, if you're in Eastern Europe, for example, you can often have a particular flavour to folk music or music from that region. Um, and there'll be a reason for that. It'll be that there'll be particular scales that are being used. And there's one further mode or scale that is, is used by Howells. And it's one that um, is very characteristic, but not always so easy to, to recognise, or certainly not unless you're, you're looking for it, which is the octatonic scale. So an octatonic scale is um, a scale that has eight distinct tones within it, rather than the seven that we have in our normal diatonic scales. The thing that's interesting about the octatonic scale is that it's often called the diminished scale or it's called um, the symmetrical diminished scale. And it has a fantastic um, other name which is called the Korsakovian scale. And the reason for this is that Rimsky-Korsakov, arguably one of the, the most famous Russian composers, part of the mighty handful um, he used it famously an awful lot. If you know Scheherazade as a, as a piece, it's full of this octatonic scale, as is Mussorgsky's music. And then Stravinsky himself, in his, uh, he was a, a pupil of rimsky korsakovs in his early works up until about 1920, he also uses the octatonic scale. There are different versions of it, and the one that we, um, I've, I've identified in Howell's sonata is the one that starts with a whole, um, a whole step. So what's happening here is, is that it's um, often called the symmetrical diminished scale is because it has alternating whole and half steps or tones and semitones. So as I, I've written that out here, so you can see whole half, whole half, whole half, whole half. And the particular octatonic scale that we find um, 
a number of times in House Sonata, starts on B. And if you, I've just written this out so you can see it. And what that means is that you end up, of course, with uh, somewhere you've always got two notes next to each other that are the same degree of the scale, albeit uh, you know a semitone apart. And you can see that here. We've got a G and a G sharp. So you get this. It's an interesting scale because within it you've got um, diminished sevenths are very neatly described. So we've got B, D, F, G sharp. And then there's another one that starts on the C sharp. So C sharp, E, G, A sharp, or B flat. Um, so this is a very useful scale. And when the music gets sort of particularly anguished and tortured, then using harmonies that are derived from an octatonic scale gives you these diminished sevenths. And then you can, use, you can uh, create melodies based on those notes. So those are the six... Uh, modes that Howells uses throughout the clarinet sonata. I hadn't really appreciated this myself when I performed it. It wasn't until I started looking at this piece for the podcast and uh, for this YouTube that I really fully appreciated its complete modality. There are probably a tiny handful of moments where the Ionian mode, if you like, is being used. Um, and he doesn't really even use sort of chromaticism in the same way. It's it's peppered in there um, at times. And as we'll see as we go, now go and look at the score, you'll see there are moments where he's, he's inflecting these modes um, using chromaticism. And that's what makes, I think, the Clanet Sonata stand out as having a really unique sound that is, is, is um, particular to Howells. So that's enough of the sort of dry theory, but it's important to um, to explain this before we have a look at the sonata. So here we go. I've used different colours for some of the different things that's, that have jumped out at me as being important, um, as well as some of my ideas about how it feels. So do go listen to the podcast if you haven't already, and there are some wonderful recordings out there, so um, uh, do go and listen along. So, as you can see, modal throughout, and we start with the D Dorian scale, which is the first one that I described there, which is all the notes of C major scale, but with D as your root. And you can see that really clearly here. Um, so we've got this sort of, the Ds here, sort of creating this kind of pedal, if you like, that goes through all the way through um, this first section. It's only until here, where we have this change to the F harmony, that we have some kind of shift from this sort of wonderful, uh, dreamy opening. So the principal motif in the piano is this, um, this quaver accompaniment, which is grouped in threes and twos. So three plus three plus two says, ti da da ti di da ti da ta da da ti di da ta da, which you might think it's sort of an eight eight rhythm. Is is quite. It has a sort of a a, a lilting, um, slightly lopsided feel to it because obviously it has the the two that breaks up the threes. Um, and the clarinet's first subject is independent of this. So we immediately create this freedom um, and the, the, the separateness of the two parts is that they're just sort of uh, meandering against one another. Um, and it gives it adds this particular sort of dreamy quality and it's, again, it, it doesn't sound like folk music, even though it's a very simple melody, ostensibly, but it has this particular quality. It's got a very magical sound. And immediately we're, we're stepping into a world which is, um, is very individual. So we stay with that. That's the, the, introducing the main ideas. We have this sort of falling semi-quaver figure, which gets wider as we go through, um, the piece is sort of is elaborated upon. And all the time you can see we've got these um, tenutos in the piano part describing the 3 plus 3 plus 2. And even when um, it's not always there, it then gets taken up as a, a melodic device here. So you can see it's kind of being pulled out of the texture. So this is the first opening section. And then we have our first sort of modulation or shift. And this shows you the... You know, Howells um, being influenced you know, in the early 20th century in that the direction that his modulations are happening are by semitone. So the first shift we have is going up by semitone. 
to the E flat Dorian just for literally four bars. So you can see that here we have our E flats appearing and we have just this, this little shift but it's still using the Dorian mode so it still feels like we're still in the same kind of uh, realm. We've just moved momentarily, the temperature has moved into a different place. And then no sooner are we there, then we move back down into um, to D and then we have a new uh, little motif that's introduced by the piano. And we're now in C sharp Dorian. So we've moved yet again um, down by a semitone. And now we've got five sharps of effectively, but it's not used as a, as a, as a key change per se, because of course we would still check, use key signatures as, as Howells does. Um, so here you can see what I've got written here, second motif, which is this kind of idea with dotted crotchets in there. Um, and then there's a sort of a variation on the first theme that the clarinet has, um, which is, as I put this variation um, in the piano, it says so it's, it's taking on this idea of three plus three plus two, but it's sort of like decorating, it's almost like you know, a mordant here, if you like. It's adding a mordant on um, on the front of this 3 plus 3 plus 2. So it's kind of a variation. It's the first variant of um, our themes. Um, figure 2, the clarinet has the opening theme that it played, but now down a semitone um, to, to match the fact that we've gone into C-sharp Dorian. And then there's something that I refer to in the podcast is this beautiful figuration, which is this the idea of um, this sort of figuration here, which is this sort of second motif, which creates a really beautiful impressionistic kind of blurring. Um, so from around about here, just as we do the writ and we go into um, this this uh, next section, because there's pedal all the way through here and the, the, the intervals are quite close, so we've got Bs and C sharps. Um, so it's kind of like creating this blur of um, C sharp minor seven is what's kind of going on here in terms of the notes. And you've got an F sharp thrown in there as well. So it's kind of, it's creating this sort of wash. Um, and it uses that sort of that's, um, new motif to achieve that with beautiful pedaling. Then you can see that the clarinet here has this, um, the the variant with the, sh the mordants in T, Toyon, D, Toyon, D. And now we've moved again. We're in um, B flat mixolydian. So we've been in sharps and we've kind of got to the point where we're kind of running out of sharps. And this is something that Howells um, um, bumps up against several times in this piece is that when you're, you're modulating, even with modes, um, if you keep going in one particular direction, eventually you fall off the other side. And obviously, when you've got C sharp Dorian, that's five sharps. Um, so any, any more twists that way, and you end up um, needing to go enharmonically. Because so, effectively, as I've written here in green, because a lot of the modulations are moving by thirds, which is a characteristic of, of this kind of uh, use of modal writing, um, the next place going down would be A sharp. So here we have this sort of momentary uh, enharmonic shift, you can see here. Um, so having been in sharps and having five sharps, you suddenly have just, we're, we're using the B flat mixolydian, which is the scale based on E flat. So we've got three flats with B flat as our center. So, um, and then no sooner we've done that for two bars, then we flip back and we're in D sharp Dorian, which is kind of the equivalent of the E flat Dorian. Um, but how sticks with his sharps? Because that seems to be the way that the harmony is going. Then at figure three, we have um, our first episode. We have a different uh, theme and some new music in now in C sharp Dorian. And I've written here angry. It's got this yagam and this sort of figuration is ta da ta da. Is something else that is used quite a lot in um, throughout the piece, and we have this sort of very um, strepitoso, this kind of real boisterous, angry, um, rushing figures in the clarinet. D ba 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 ba, da 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 di da da di di da. So this di da, this kind of figuration, this rhythm, is a new um, propulsion, propulsive figuration. 
Again, we have this sort of enharmonic thing going on here. We've been in lots of sharps, and then all of a sudden, just for a little while, we have a, a shift to flats. So, again, because we've got C sharp Dorian, we've got an awful lot of sharps um, in the mix there, and we can't really go um, any further. So it's the equivalent of like D flat Dorian, and then we have E flat Dorian um, down here, as you can see where I've marked it. So there's this kind of enharmonic shifting here. Um, we have the opening motif, piano motif, makes a reappearance in this just little transition period at the bottom of the page. And then this wonderful, see, I put searingly emotional clarinet line. It says, fortissimo ma espressivo. So there's this free counterpoint here. This is something that you might, might attribute to Howells being um, an organist and a study. He studied a lot of uh, medieval music and Tudor music, Tudor, Tudor uh, choral music. Um, having these freely independent lines creating counterpoint, very much like a re Renaissance polyphony. Um, and you know, the, the piano part and the clarinet part are moving in contrary motion, so it goes from a very widely spaced and then moves back into the middle. Um, we've had another modulation here, an interesting one through this little transition at the bottom. We've gone from an E flat Dorian to B Aeolian. Now this is another one of those interesting uh, uh, axes, which is the the tritone. So here E flat to B is a tritone, which is a, a, an ex an exact uh, incision halfway in, in between an octave. So it's again a, a point of tension. So um, it goes. It's the furthest key away, really. If you think of you know, B major, E flat major, they, they couldn't be more difficult. Now, we're not in um, major or minor here, but we've gone from an E flat to now B Aeolian. Um, so it means that we've got all of the notes of the D major scale, but B is our tonal center. I mean, there's lots of Ds, to be fair, as well. So you could, you know, it's sort of, why is it not D major? It doesn't feel like D major, and we end up... Um, So we can see here, we've got B and the harmony, and there's a big B here sort of um, moment. So this is definitely B Aeolian. It's, it's, it doesn't feel like it's major. It feels like we've got this, um, this natural minor sense. There's very few A sharps. You get the odd ones that, are, that move kind of in a sort of chromatic way. Um, but they're, they're short-lived, and for the most part, it's clearly B Aeolian. And that carries on over into the next page. So we then now have the second subject proper. So all of that energy and that um, that ire melts away, and we have the second subject, which is presented in the piano. And this is perhaps the most folky moment in uh, the whole sonata, with this beautiful, very simple melody. <laughs> um, it has a very uh, folky bake. Bass. So we're still in B Aeolian here with the occasional A sharp thrown in. And then we go to E and C. And we have this sort of first, what I've written here is this first episode variation. So we've got this. So this, the semi quavers that were, you know, were rushing down in the first part and the clarinet part. We then have this sort of um, upward turning group of semi, semi quavers here, which becomes. A new, a new variant on that um, the opening theme. So this is the first episode, and I've called it the variation. Um, the other thing that's just worth noting, just a little thing, is that with, with all of this, I don't quite know where it comes from. I can't chart it back, but here, where I've written a new mo motif, this paradi di yum bom, where you have this, is kind of describing very expressively. Um, an octave. So if you've got E as your is your focus here, um, so E's and F sharps. This is the seconds either side of an E. It's presented here in a very beautiful way um, in the piano, which is kind of we have this this this, this moment where we we move to a a C. Um, we've got this yeah this C tonality. We go right down to a bottom C here, which is a really beautiful moment. And this tail motif here is, is interesting because it's introduced here. It's the first time um, it appears. And it's used every now and then, and it just has a very particular quality. I can't describe it. You just have to go away and listen. 
um, and see what I'm, I'm driving at. So we then, figure five, we're, we're building up again here. Slentando means that it's slowing down, and then we have this ta di 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 ta da da di di dom This figuration here in the um, piano. This is again, it's going back a little bit to that sort of dotted crotchet, quaver dotted crotchet, the, the blurring um, impressionistic thing that I was talking about earlier. It's based on that, but now it's it's really quite declamatory. There again, you can see our first the, the first episode that I was talking about this tabadabadi. These semi-quavers. Um, and this is one of the places that we have an interesting variation on those modes that I was talking about. Um, so the reason I've got these blue highlights going around the A-sharps is because um, we have what's called the um, mixolydian with a flattened second. This is a mode that is in fact based on the harmonic minor scale, as we would know it. So... If I describe, if you think of B harmonic minor, which has a key signature of F sharp and C sharp, and it has a raised seventh, which is an A sharp, when you then um, have that note in um, your mode, then you have this, this variant um, of the Mixolydian scale. So there are a number of places where this comes in, and this is... Uh, an interesting sort of tense and slightly shiftless place where the harmony is is more chromatically um, influenced than just these the, the plain modes that we've seen before. You see, I've marked in this again this tritone um, that comes in in the harmony C to F sharp. This creates sort of unease and tension in the music. Um, and then these are just sort of scribbles to try and work out. You can see a lot of the things that are moving here. C to A flat, this idea, again, of moving in minor thirds. This is a, a harmonic progression that happens a lot when you're using modes. And then a chromatic shift from A flat to A, and then we're back into a normal kind of progression of tonic and dominant. So A minor is something, an area where we're kind of flirting with momentarily um, through this, this transition section. And then we arrive at this... Again, it's tari, party, this 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 um, figuration that's now more declamatory than it was um, at the second subject point. Um, and it becomes really expressive. We, we fix our mode quite um, noticeably here with C-sharp Aeolian, which is of the natural minor sound again, so C-sharp natural minor. You can see the opening motif in the piano that makes a reappearance. And these... Again, this, this, this florid, very, very um, decorated um, ex extrovert and virtuosic writing in both the clarinet and the piano part here. Um, it's, it's a wonderful, rushing uh, energy. Uh, and then once, no sooner have we had this, these, uh, sorry, turning the page back again, these big flurries that um, the clarinetist has to listen very carefully to what the pianist is doing. As you can see, there's an awful lot of notes there. So there's a lot of coordination issues going on there. And once we get to the top of that, it's it's all fortissimo from both players, and it's free, it's independent of one another again, this this, this polyphonic approach where the lines are woven in, into one another. And then this energy then gradually subsides and ebbs away. The piano calms things down and settles things with the opening motif that it has, the 3 plus 3 plus 2 again. That sort of has this calming effect. At the beginning, it's so dreamy. And every time um, Howells wants to uh, to calm things down, he reintroduces this opening motif. And the clarinet sort of responds and gradually just disappears right down to um, the bottom uh, E. Then we introduce a new thing. So we have a, it's kind of really a variant on the piano's opening 3 plus 3 plus 2. Now, without the calming, flowing notes in between, it becomes really quite ominous and menacing when it's just played as, as straight chords. And the chords are, are quite dense, even though it's in a pianissimo dynamic. So again, I've, I've written here, um, ominous. And we're in, in the, have the Phrygian mode for the first time um, in the piece, which is, has a different sound, so it's, that's, Phrygian is quite 
um, dark one. It's based on the third degree of the scale, which if you think of in relation to C major, that's the one that kind of has E minor at its heart. Um, but it, it's a very particular sound, and, it's, and it, it has a really st strong effect at this point. Um, so we have this this little new motif here, tabadam di yara dom, um, which is introduced several times in the piano, as you can see here, before the clarinet comes in um, at figure seven. Um, underneath again, we've got this this um, this quite ominous throbbing opening motif, um, and having been some somewhat distant and. Uh, like gathering storm, it's sort of it's coming. It's a yeah, gathering storm is perhaps the best way of describing it. Gradually, the harm harmony moves, and it feels like it's gaining confidence. It's it's kind of winding up again. So I've put in here becoming confident again, and the harmonies is quite difficult to pin down at this point. There's it's a lot of major minor things going on, um, and then just as we have this crescendo, it's sort of arrested. We don't don't quite. Um, know where we're going to end up. Um, and we have this thundering, uh, it's kind of like a recapitulation. Well, no, it is, it is the recapitulation. But now we're in C-sharp mixolydian. Um, and we've had this progression before, which is you know, uh, quite an interesting um, slide. So it, it's interesting where that Howells writes this. So the beginning of the bar is missing. So this feels like um, a whole series of, Upbeats are very extended um, upbeats. Yabada, gigo, daga, da, digo, da, da, ba, di, di, ba, da, ba, di, di, di. And we're faster. So it says, come primo, ma più mosso. So we're not this calm um, Dorian mode that we had at the beginning. We've changed. We're now using the Mixolydian mode for a little while. And we kind of shift around between um, having an awful lot of sharps. There's either six or seven sharps flying around here. And this, the uh, clarinet, again, soaring independently of the piano over the top. So we have C-sharp, F-sharp, G-sharp. Those are our centres. Um, and then we kind of settle back from these um, different modes to when we arrive. Here you can see the um, Aeolian and the Dorian, which are... Aeolian, they're both... And the Dorian, they're both minor modes, effectively. So the Aeolian is the natural minor and the Dorian is the second degree mode so they both have again returned to this sort of darker quality mixolydian is is more um, major so it's the one that's based on the fifth so it's like gbd so it's a bit more like you can imagine g major um, and here we've got like a minor and d minor now that figure that I was talking about before that was one of the linking passages, this So as we're kind of the the energy is diminishing again, we have this this cloudy impressionistic veil. Figure nine, um, we have a restatement of the second subject, which was originally what was introduced by the piano. This time we're in F sharp Aeolian. And at the end of this, the very the last thing I wrote in kind of this sort of pinky colour, see page six. That was the bit that I was talking about. This this ta di da da yum dum. The the motif that was expressively describing the octave with seconds either side, and that suddenly makes a rec um, a reappearance, both times in the clarinet part. So it's like a tail figure that um, Howells introduces. Second subject again here. Um, and we're, we're coming towards uh, the end of the piece. So we've got the opening motif again, figure 10, which is done in this kind of slightly ominous pianissimo chordal thing. Um, and Howells really liked this sort of figuration. And it's something that um, I've seen in other composers around this sort of time. John Ireland uses this in his clarinet trio. This, it, it creates a sort of dark, deep rumbling sound when you've got um, a fifth and an octave around it. And it's right at the bottom of the um, bottom of the piano, so um, it tends to just create this sort of yeah deep thundering, distant thunder. Um, again, I've been circling these notes just to try and work out what the, the mode was. So we have B mixolydian, um, and these D naturals are interesting because they're they're cancelling out. 
um, denotes in the key signature. So gradually everything winds back down and we end up with possibly the, the calmest key. We started in D Dorian and we end with A Aeolian, which is the A natural minor. So you can see the key signature, we get rid of all the sharps and we're just left with this wonderful deep bottom A that um, ushers in the coda, where we have the, the rocking figure again from the beginning and a restatement of the opening melody. Um, this time, interestingly, as we had this before, down a minor third. So it has a different interplay between the piano harmony and um, the notes in the clarinet. Um, and that's... Oh yeah, this final thing, the thing that I've, I've outlined in yellow here, we have this these little crunches, these little kind of um, piquant crunches in this um, opening piano motif. So instead of just having the, sort of the, the, the straight notes, singular notes, we've got these little discords, you know, a D and an E and a C and a D and a C and a D sharp. They're little crunches and it's something that House just introduces here right at the very end of the first movement but then is brought back with absolutely exquisite effect in the second movement. So hence why I just put this as a quotation of something coming later on. So that's the first movement. There's an awful lot in there um, but it really gets you into the um, the ideas, the themes um, of Howes' Sonata. S second movement um, is full of drive and energy and vitality and anger, I think. There's, a, there's an awful lot of kind of, of um, uh, volatility. We start in B Aeolian, so it's effectively a minor mode. Um, and there are lots of fourths in this. Fourths and... Um, uh, less chromaticism to start with. We have a little bit, it's more kind of, uh, sort of, as it were, white note harmony. So you can see the, there aren't so very many accidentals. So we um, we have this Aeolian mode, but it's in using the fourths more than we're using thirds. And that creates a very particular kind of sound. And it's, it's lots of little rushing, uh, small motifs. Uh, the other thing we have is a tritone, and again, having had the fourths at the beginning with the intervals, then we have the uh, the actual theme played when the clarinet comes in uh, a fourth above what it was in the piano part. So that's an interesting thing there. There's a decision, a very conscious decision by Howells to move in fourths. Um, Howells uses 7-8 quite a lot in this fast second movement, and he used something similar in the oboe sonata that comes from a few years before, 1942. Um, in the podcast I talk about it being rejected by Leon Goossens, which must have uh, really hurt um, Howells, having spent so much time creating this, um, this sonata for a much revered musician, only to have it basically sent back and said, you know, I don't want it, thank you very much. You know, it's it's unplayable. Um, and in that, there are some moments where there are some really, really complicated rhythms and they sound, um, they're un sort of unnecessarily complex. They're very difficult to to perform and keep on top of. And it, it's, it makes for a very uh, uncomfortable listening experience. And Howells has definitely learned from this experience, I think, in the clarinet sonata, because yes, he wants this sort of angularity and this this um, uncertainty that an irregular time signature brings, and in a way, it's kind of like a, a mirror of almost a mirror of what he had in the first movement, which was three plus three plus two. Now we've got two plus two plus three, so it goes yada di da 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 So this melody da 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 so it's, it's got a real drive and impetus to it. And again, in pianissimo to start with, so it has real energy. Um, lots of marks on here, which is me trying to, again to work out harmonically what's going on. The harmony is less interesting here, and there's more chromaticism and more unpredictability. It, it doesn't, it's not um, relying so much on, on, on the modes, whereas it's got these sort of, it's the shapes of the phrases that is the kind of real character here. So lots of these 
quick moving semiquavers like we had in the first movement. Um, it's jerky, it's angular, it's, t it's contorted. Um, this is the first time that um, I've identified, at least, that we, they're using the octatonic scale. It's particularly, you can see it in here um, and in the notes at um, this point. So um, it's not something that when you're listening, you're going to go, oh, yeah, that's the octatonic scale. <laughs> but it's there, and it's the point where um, Howells is deviating from the, the kind of tonal palette that he's done before. So we have this little, little section where it's, it's um, octatonic before shifting back to um, the modes that we've... Uh, discussed at length throughout this piece. So again, there you can see this this scale coming down here. That's all um, optotonic. As you can see, you've got um, C sharps and C naturals. That's always a kind of a um, a way of identifying it because an optotonic scale always has somewhere two notes next to each other um, that are the same degree of the scale but a, a semitone apart. So you've got two Cs, which is not what you'd normally have in a, um, a normal uh, major or minor mode. Um, and then effectively, this is a bit where for a little while we kind of have something that feels a little bit like A minor, um, but not for very long. <laughs> the, the clarinet part has this, this angular, angry figure. Dee da ba ba buddy ba da So it's, it's, it's all twisting and turning and writhing. Um, um, and then we have this figuration that's coming in here. So in here, this is... Which is the figuration that we had at the very, very opening brought back in the piano. And again, independent of what the clarinet's doing, the clarinet has got its own sort of quite uh, first movement red, um, redolent uh, melodic line here. It's more lyrical, it's more um, shapely. But independent of that, you've got this scurrying piano writing that goes against it. And then at figure seven, we have um, the recapitulation, B.A. Aeolian. Um, so all of those figures that you just had um, being reintroduced in the piano part, um, they're kind of leading us back into a proper traditional recap of the opening music. And again, we've got our seven, eight time signatures. Um, And so it goes on. There's, there's, there's using all of these different devices. There's nothing new brought in. It's just using all the themes that um, Howells has set out. Then you can see here figure 10. The clarinet, again, is, is doing its own sweet independent thing. And underneath, you've got this first movement motif coming in. And this is this clever way that Howells wraps up this sonata, is that he does a bit of a full circle. He, he wants to bring in... Um, some of the elements that we had in the first movement. And this is the first time that that appears. Um, and then, as again, as the energy, as much as it's been a tidal wave up, then it, it sinks right back down again, to right to the very bottom of the instrument, down to C. And we have this little mini cadenza linking passage where there's um, a chord laid down in the piano. And out of the sort of mists and murk of that, the clarinet uh, appears here. And this is just the beginning of what is some of the most stunning writing in, in the piece. So the Lento Espressivo figure 11, we have this kind of almost like a, a harp um, figuration where the pedal is down and you have all of these notes of the F sharp minor um, chord against G, G sharp minor in the right hand. So you've got this, this clash between two. Again, it's the F sharp and G sharp. We have this, the seconds in the first movement. Um, and we have a restatement of the second subject from the first movement in the piano. So the piano introduced the second subject in the first movement. And here um, it's being brought in again to try and tie everything up from the first movement. Now we're in F sharp aeolian, which is a different key to how it was set out to begin with. And the clarinet then has its turn of playing this this kind of it's the most folky part, as I described it earlier, and um, the second subject. And this this leads it's it's absolutely heartbreaking. It's it's one of the most stunning bits uh, of the whole sonata. 
and it's already quite slow. So this um, we're lento espressivo. I mean, lento is not strictly speaking crotch equals seventy two, but that's how's giving us the flavour of what's coming through. It's, it's sort of it's um there's a slowness, there's a stillness. We've got rid of all that motoric kind of driving figuration or even the dreamy quality that we had at the beginning. It's much more open. Um, and that makes way through a series of um, ritardandos to placido on poco più lento. Now, this is usually played slower than it's marked um, because we have these little clusters again, these little crunches on our opening motif from the first movement of the piano. And they're just exquisite. And they just really need, and it's penis, it's so delicate, it's kind of, it's sort of post apocalyptic, I think is how I described it in the podcast. And over the top of that, we have um, the first movement quote. So we have the theme from the clarinet in the first movement, but now again transposed into a different key. And it just slowly um, has this deja vu moment of re. re returning to this um, opening new, the opening music from the beginning, which was very dreamy. And then the coda is, um, it's a, a final fiery flurry from pianissimo sotto voce of the second movement's um, figuration, this, the groups of fours. So here you can see again that second, we had that in the first movement. Now it's, it comes back again and it's, it's mixed in and it's just really just a, a kind of a, uh, a race to the finish line. Um, and we have these interesting, another cause here, the C Aeolian dominant. I'm not going to go into that right now, but it's, it's another, derivation of the um, Aeolian uh, mode, but it um, has a slightly different configuration of notes. And we're getting faster and faster at cello ando, più mosso era a cello ando, and we just have this um, resounding, thunderous ba ba bum at the end. Um, as I'm sure you, you are getting loud and clear, this is one of my absolute favourite sonatas, and I've really enjoyed uh, getting under the bonnet on it and fi- trying to find out a little bit more about how it's constructed and and fi- making some really startling discoveries myself. I hadn't really done any analysis on it at all. Um, but there's a reason why it has such a, a specific sound world and why it's so effective. Um, and this was the last chamber work that Howells wrote, which is um, great for us as clarinetists and as lovers of chamber music. But um, it's such a shame that he didn't write more because this is um, it's a, a masterful work and it's full of invention and interest. Um, it's endlessly interesting. So I hope you've um, found this interesting and um, enlightening. If you haven't already, please go over to my website um, and check that out. And you can also find their links to the podcast that accompany these YouTube videos. Um, the website address again is www stuart-king.com and you can find the podcasts on all the usual places apple google spotify anchor fm and other things like that so for now thank you very much for listening take care and i look forward to seeing you for another exploration very soon